Good morning. How are you? It's kind of cool when you're worshiping and your daughter sends you a Snapchat. She's worshiping too up in Fairmont and let me know she's where she's supposed to be. And that's always encouraging. So I snapped her a picture of Dale and sent it back to her to say, aha, look what you're missing. Uh, it's good to see you this morning. Glad you made it out. Uh, I hope that 10 to 15 percent estimate was wrong last week. But if you're new to us, I'm Pastor David. Thanks for being here. Um, we are in the middle, I mean really in the middle of the First Corinthians study. And as you know, if you've been with us, this is not easy stuff. This is, this is uh, you know, meat and potatoes. It's really tough sometimes, but it's, it's God's truth that was intended for His church in the first century and it's intended for us in the 21st. The title of the series is pretty straightforward, For Not Of, just to explain what that means. The church is supposed to be for the world, not of the world. We're supposed to be of Christ instead. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what happened to this first church, this church of Corinth. Paul was there. He planted the seeds of the gospel. People got on fire for Jesus. They were seeing amazing things happen. They established churches and leadership. Paul says, you guys got it. I got to move on. And within a few years, he starts getting letters back to him with questions, with concerns. And so Paul can't go back physically, so instead he writes this letter. And this letter was written to them to say, guys, you can't be of the world anymore. You were saved from that. That's what you used to be. You've got to be for the world and of Christ. And so it was preserved for us today because the same problems exist. The world continues to creep into the church, and we've got to make sure that we're not of the world we're for the world. Now, today's message is really special. Um, I hope every message is special, but this one, this one is the one that really should stand out in your heart and your mind. Uh, Jesus instituted, by instruction and example, two specific ordinances, the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of communion. Before he left, Jesus said, go, make and teach disciples and baptize them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So by instruction, Jesus called us to baptize. And by example, he allowed John to baptize him. And so we got that ordinance. And then now, we talk about what happened in that room that day. That last Passover that Jesus observed with his disciples. Where he not only instructed, but took communion with his people. And so we're going to do that today. One of my commentators, Leon Morris, appropriately says... Holy Communion is not just another service. It is a solemn rite instituted by our Lord Himself. So this is not just another Sunday service. Every Sunday is special, but today has great significance. We typically do communion um, at different times. We do it in the evening service, first Sunday of the month, if you didn't know that. Uh, we do it during the summer at our picnics, uh, right after the 11 o'clock service. Every now and then, we'll do it Sunday morning to get everybody involved. And this is not random. This is where we are in the text. And so it's a very special opportunity for us today. So please turn in your teaching uh, passage in the Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to read verses 17 through 34. So why don't you stand with us, please, if you just want to listen to the reading or if you want to follow along, this is the New Living Translation. That's why it sounds a little different. It's, it's very easy to read and understand, and it's well written. So that's what I read from. It's on my iPad. Here we go. This is the Word of God to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. But, and I'll explain why he has to make this transition. In the following instructions, I cannot praise you. For it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First... I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. But, of course, there must be divisions among you so that those or you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself. On the night when He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and He gave thanks to God for it. Then He broke it in pieces and said, 
This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ... You are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Listen, that is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So, my dear brothers and sisters, Christians, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you're really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about other matters after I arrive. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the significant opportunity we have today. Uh, Father, we're going to get the opportunity to remember the reason we have the hope of eternal life. It's not about anything we've ever done. It's about everything you have done. And so today we just stop and we thank you. Now I pray that you'll touch our hearts with the warnings in this passage and the instructions in this passage so that we can take communion in a worthy manner this morning and be blessed by it. God, I ask that you touch those who aren't saved, the ones who aren't Christians, who come to church, they're faithful to it sometimes, or maybe they're here for the first time. I don't know what reason they came. But they get to see the greatest illustration of your love for us this morning in the body that was broken, the blood that was shed for them. Maybe this will be the day of their salvation. I pray that is the solution this morning for them. God, I ask you to remove me from your word and speak through it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Please be seated. When I first became pastor, um, it troubled me the way we did communion and the way I had done communion in other churches. Typically, again, it's the same rotation. The first Sunday of the month, you have to do communion. And so you have a sermon, you do the message. Oh, and by the way, before you go, we're going to do communion. And so you get some juice, you get some bread, you pass it around, you check the box, you had communion. Regardless of what the message was, regardless of what the situation was, okay, we checked the box. We had communion the first Sunday of the month. That's not okay. That's unworthy. All right? Many of you have experienced it. I experienced it. And it really challenged me. This should be a significant service for us. And today it's going to be. Apostle Paul, he he goes through this and, and he starts off, I am so glad that you're following the teachings I passed on to you. So, yeah, it sounds like in this section of the letter that this church was really struggling. So Paul is trying to be encouraging. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm addressing a couple of issues. But overall, you really are doing well. I I am very blessed and proud to hear the positive things that are happening in this church. But notice what he started off with, but. He's encouraged them in the previous sections, but now he says, but. In this, I cannot praise you. Why? They were doing a lot of things well, but they were messing up on communion. And and like I've already said, I, I believe a lot of churches are messing it up as well. We are taking it unworthily. So let's see and understand what that means this morning. Let's talk about the offenses. Okay? Paul starts the chastisement, and that's what it is, by saying it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you get together. That should never be. When we get together in the church, this should be our safe place. We hear that a lot in the culture today. The church should be our safe place. The church should be the place we can come and say, whew, I am so glad to be here. I can, I, I can be myself here. I, I can open myself up to everybody here. I can trust you. If you ask me how I'm doing, I'm going to be honest. and I'm, I'm not going to just lie and say I'm fine. I'm going to be able to tell you I'm not okay. This is the place where it should be okay to not be okay. This is that 
thing that should be so much more valuable than, than the relationships at work, so much more valuable than the relationships at school, so much more valuable than the relationships at the ball field or, or wherever you go. This should be our place, our place where we just love to get together. And be, just like yesterday, we had a lot of awesome times yesterday. Did anybody get to be here yesterday, any of you? We had a few. Wasn't that awesome? I mean, that's how the church should be. Everybody here was enjoying everybody's company. And again, you felt safe. You felt comfortable. You felt like you were loved. And that's the way it should be. But unfortunately, in a lot of churches, it's not. Not everybody experiences that. A lot of people just go through the motions of church. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason it's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, the word translated here, more harm. He says more harm than good is being done when you come together, meet for communion. It literally means morally evil. It's kind of been toned down. But in the Greek, it, mean, it means you guys really, when you get together, it's morally evil when it should be blessed. All right, It should be blessed. What was so evil about it? Divisions. First, he says, I know that there are divisions in the church. We've talked about this if you weren't with us in the beginning of the letter. Um, there were divisions in the church over who they were following. Well, I follow Apollos, and I follow Paul, and I follow Peter. All right? They, they were star-bellied sneeches, those Dr. Seuss folks in the room. Anybody a Dr. Seuss fan? All right? I got a star on my belly. I'm following Paul. I got a star on my belly. I was baptized by Apollos. All right? It was spiritual pedigree that they were boasting about. And they were divided. They were saying, my, my, my spiritual pedigree is better than yours. So there was division based upon that. And, and we discussed that already. That's not okay. Any source of division in the church is morally evil. It doesn't matter what its source is. It's morally evil. And I like what he did say. He, he, he said, to some extent, I believe it. It was being a little exaggerated in whatever he had received. But he did say, to some extent, I do believe it. Uh, he says, okay, so yeah, I know there is some division. And he says, by the way, there should be. There should be some division. Those who are, who are godly, those who are, uh, who are doing things right, who are living right, yeah, there's going to be a natural division there. But that is not what he's talking about. He's saying, no, there are some divisions in this church. Um, what were they divided over specifically in this passage? They were shaming the poor. Right? Yeah, there was divisions in the church, and division, any division is wrong. But in this context, he is talking about shaming the poor. Paul says, some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. Some go hungry while others get drunk. All right, yeah, they had wine, real wine, at their communion. So that's a different discussion for a different day. Um, but let's, let's connect to the culture of the day. Let's understand what was being of the world in this description. In those days, there were a lot of social clubs, fraternal organizations, just like there are today. And when you got together and you had your banquets or your feasts, everybody just pitched in. Hey, if everybody puts $10 in, we can get Chick-fil-A for our next meal, right? Uh, everybody would just pitch in. Everybody throws their money in and they have their banquet and, and that should be cool. But it wasn't. When it's of the world... You had some people who could give more and some people who couldn't give any in the group. And so those people who could give more, guess what? They got more. And so the ones who brought the good stuff, the ones who put the most money in, got influential treatment. They got more food, they got the best food. And then when those that really couldn't afford it, that were out there busting their tails, doing their jobs, working, they would come in late to the meetings and oftentimes there'd be nothing left. Those influential people had eaten all the good stuff and they left nothing for the people the poor people, the lower social class people. And that was what it meant to be of the world. The church was doing that. When the church would gather, they would typically have a meal, if you study the book of Acts, they would typically eat together and then take communion. That's how it was practiced, just like we do in the summer times. So they would eat their meal and then take communion. And what was happening is you had influential people who were putting more money in the offering plate and getting better treatment than those who were not. And so they would come in before communion and they'd eat all the food and drink all the wine and others would show up and there would be nothing left for them. This was social class division. I'm better than you because God gave me more stuff. And so that was another division that comes out that Paul says, that is not okay. You don't get to do that. He says, don't you have homes for eating in and drinking in or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? 
So basically they were mocking the very purpose they were supposed to be gathering for. They were gathering for unity among believers. So let's talk about this, mocking the Lord's death. These are strong words, all right, mocking the Lord's death. I'm going to go back to and pick up verse 20 to start this line of discussion. Paul says this, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. This is another uh, translation that's kind of tame. Basically, what Paul is saying is nothing you're doing is honoring Christ. Nothing. I mean, he's just flat out chastising them. Everything you do is morally evil when you get together for, communi- for communion. Nothing is honoring him. These are very, very strong words. As one of my commentators, John MacArthur, said, they had a ceremony, but not the reality. The form, but not the substance. All right, listen closely. This is happening in churches today. The first Sunday of the month, all around our nation. Professing Christians are putting on fake smiles. They're pretending to like each other. They're coming in. They're checking their box. They're getting their juice. They're getting their bread. They're saying, I am done. And they are taking communion unworthily. And there are consequences for that. That's a fake communion. It's a mockery of the body and the blood of Christ. As Paul says, if you've got issues like that, if you've got divisions, if you're prejudiced, if you've got those problems, stay home the first of the month. Don't come to communion because there can be trouble. So he moves on to explain why this is so important with the institution. Let's talk about the institution. Uh, remember, Paul was not there in that Passover. Okay? Paul was not one of the apostles originally, so he was not in that room when Jesus did this. And yet he says, I received this of the Lord. Paul, in several situations, uses that wording, I received this from the Lord. Paul had a divine salvation. He had this revelation of God through Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And then he did go away for some time to prepare. And in that time he was away, the Lord spoke to him directly. And so these are not things that necessarily Paul saw, but he received them from the Lord. And that is so important for us to understand. Um, There are several cases, again, in the New Testament where this happened, but this is one of the very important times. He says, I received this from the Lord, and this is the Lord's Supper, that the bread is the body. That's what he received from the Lord. When we take this bread, this is the body of Christ. It doesn't become flesh. There are some circles and some... Uh, beliefs that when we bless it, it literally becomes flesh. That's just goofy. All right, That's just way out there. If you study the Greek and you dig deep enough into it, we don't have time to explain it. It is very clear what Paul is saying and what Jesus had said. He said, this is representing my body. The important words in this statement are really neat. Uh, they're, they're literally translated to for us. This was done for us. In other words, what happened to his body when we take communion, we're remembering what happened for us. Uh, He was beaten for us. His flesh was torn off his back for us. In his body, he took the nails for us. And in the literal human being, in the flesh, he died for us. So when we take that bread and we break it, it should be bittersweet. It should be painful because I couldn't do this in my own flesh. But it should be joyful because God did it for me. This body was broken for me. That should be awe-inspiring when we stop and think about it. I couldn't do it. He did it for me. Okay, That's the bread. It's for me. The juice is the blood. The second part of the ordinance is equally significant to know when we pray over it, it does not turn to blood. All right? We are not drinking blood, but some people think that's what happens. They are taught that. And theologically, that is way out because we're told uh, when James and them bring the news to the Christians, that's one of the things we're not allowed to do. We're not allowed to drink blood. And so it is not blood. It is juice that represents the hope that we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. You got to think of the people in the room and the Passover they were going through. They were Jews. And so all their life they had been taught without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so they sacrificed for all those years. Sacrificial offerings made, supposed to be pointing towards Christ. As we know, the, the blood of bulls and goats could not forgive. And yet, 
Jesus died one time for all time. He offered himself as that sacrifice. So those Jewish men, the aha moment had to be incredible. We've been going to the, temp, the temple. We've been offering sheep. We've been offering goats. We've been seeing the bloodshed. And now Jesus is saying, no, this is my blood that establishes a new covenant because they kept failing at the old covenant. They kept falling away. And yet Jesus said, now this is my blood. This new covenant is established with me. It is one time for all time. So when you take that juice, that's what you're doing. You're honoring the fact that his blood was shed one time for all time. Okay? One time for all time. That was what was instituted. Now, in verse 26, we have a transition. Every time you come to church and you hear a message, you will respond. You'll either accept what you hear as God's word as truth, and the Holy Spirit will change you because of it, or you'll reject it, and there'll be consequences for it. One or the other, good or bad, depends on what you do with it. The same is true with communion, as we hear in this passage. Every time you take communion, you will have either a good response or a bad response. Okay, let's walk through this. Let's talk about the outcome. I'm purposely going to do this backwards because I want to end on a positive note. Okay, just to tell you up front, I want to go into communion in an encouraging way. So, I want to end on a positive note. Paul says in verse 27, he uses a phrase that most of us are familiar with if you've ever been in church. He speaks of eating unworthily. All right, eating unworthily. There, there's no difficulty in the Greek to translate that. It literally means to be unworthy of something. Uh, I've already mentioned how this can be. We are unworthy if we come to church just going through the motions. If we come unprepared, if we come just checking the box because I took the juice and I broke the bread and yada, 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 I had communion today, whew, I feel a lot better about it. That's unworthy. Okay, that's not the way we're supposed to do it. It's also unworthy if you come and you take communion and you've got bitterness in your heart against another believer. If there's an unresolved conflict and you take communion, you are risking these things. Weakness, sickness, death. That's powerful. So if we have bitterness in our heart that we have not dealt with, either pass the plate or stay home. One or the other. This is not figurative. This is literal. Those Corinthians were literally experiencing, and I, and I like what Leon Moore says, spiritual ills may have physical results. The ill health and even deaths of some of those Corinthian Christians were the result of taking communion unworthily. That's something. Now the good news is, as you heard, right? The good news is God does not eternally condemn believers. He disciplines believers. And these are acts of discipline for us when these things happen. But they literally happen. Don't take communion if you're not ready for it. Don't take communion if you're, you're not prepared. Because there are physical consequences to the spiritual illness of being unworthy. We have to take that solemnly. Right? But what does eating worthily mean? Eating worthily means my heart is right. That's the title of the message today. Having the right heart. Coming into the church thinking, I, I need to be here. Coming into the church saying, I want to see God. Coming into the church, I, I want to be more like Christ. That's the whole reason for being here. That's worthily. It's coming in here saying, I, I, I've dealt with my stuff. I haven't left these things open. I, I don't have bitterness in my heart because I have forgiven. I have overlooked. I have done the things I need to do. I want to be worthy of communion. And if we come worthily, what do we get? We get the remembrance. All right? Jesus said, do this to remember me. Do this to remember me. And Paul goes on to say a little later, hey, we do this to remember him until he returns. So until Jesus comes back, this is remembering the body and the blood that was for us. So we do this. All right. Hi there. Welcome back. All right. We do this as a remembrance, and it should be just awe inspiring. Remember, it should be painful to think that I couldn't do this. It should be joyful to know that God loved me enough to do this. That's the remembrance. 
It should bring humility. All right, this should humble us. Why in the world would we have any ounce of prejudice when Jesus died for all? Why in the world would we think we were better than anyone else when the Lord owns it all? Why would we be unforgiving when the Lord forgives all? Just considering the reason that we gather for communion should be humbling because this was done for all. Finally, it should bring unity. Every evening service, Sunday night, Wednesday, if you're not a part of it, we pray for unity in this church. Because unity is power. Unity is evangelism. Unity is attractive. And communion should bring us together. We, we had it recently in chapter 10. The Apostle Paul says, When we bless the cup of the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we're all eating from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. This is not just any other Sunday morning service. All are important. But this one has the significance of remembering the body and the blood of Christ. We can walk out blessed or we can walk out cursed. One way or the other. It depends on what you do next. That's why Paul says in verse 31, examine ourselves so we'll not be judged by God in this way. So here's what we're going to do. Dale's going to sing a song. I'm going to offer a prayer. This is the time designated to become worthy. Is anybody worthy of the body and the blood of Christ? No. Absolutely not. We can't get that in our heads. What makes us worthy is His blood. And so we need to humble ourselves this morning. We need to search our, ask God to search our hearts and say, God, reveal to me anything in my heart that would make me unworthy of taking communion. And when he does, we offer it up, we repent, and then we are ready. If you're not a Christian, pass the plate unless you are ready. This is the gospel. This is, this is what it took for you to be right. This is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Right where you sit, in your seat, you can say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus Christ and what he has done for me. Please save me and make me one of your children. And today you can be saved. You can take communion and make that profession of faith this morning by letting one of us know the decision that you've made. Either way, we need to make sure we are worthy. And this is our opportunity. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you so much for your sacrifice. You sent your son to die for our sins because none of us were worthy. And so now we want to remember that. We, we want to humble ourselves. We want to be unified by the body and the blood of Christ. And so for those of us who are already believers, forgive us for taking it so lightly. Forgiving, uh, forgive us for mocking communion. Father, just touch our hearts in a special way so that we get this remembrance this morning. For those who aren't saved, Father, you brought them to church at, at a significant Sunday. A Sunday where this is all about the sacrifice that was made for them. May they see this and understand what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you have revealed that to their heart, give them the strength and courage to step out this morning and say, I, I want to follow Jesus Christ. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. This is your time.